Open the pod bay doors now. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. So I am going to introduce our guest today, um, speaking on the topic of the gender gap in uh, STEM um, fields. Uh, to my right here is Kay Smith, Assistant Professor of Physics at St. Kate's, and next to her is Christy Pollatt, Assistant Professor of Mathematics at St. Kate's, and on the end is Kristen Womack, founder of Night Sky Web Co. and Hack the Gap. And um, I'm just going to get out of the way and let these guys take over. So thank you very much for coming out. We had just a little bit of data to start out with. This is all um, from the NSF's website. So if you're curious about more data, I just Googled um, women in STEM data. Um, I, the National Science Foundation does a lot of research in this. OK. So on the first slide, um, this is just a representation of who is in STEM overall. Um, and on the next slide, there will be a similar, um, no, this is who is in the US overall. So what you wanna pay attention to um, is the si size of the pie for white men. And then if you wanna switch to the next slide, they take over when we go to the representation in STEM. Um, basically, everybody went down by about 50%, except for the white men and the Asian men. Um, we have it broken down a little bit by discipline, so this is in physics. Um, the bars on the left show you the percentage of each um, degree that are awarded to women. Um, so the bachelor's degree is around 20%, and then it decreases up to the doctorate. Um, I think the next slide is computer science, so also around 20% for computer science. Um, all the way up, computer science stays the same. Let me check. Something of note, if you look at the percentage of bachelor's degrees in computer science going to men or to women, it's been decreasing. So the, the blue bar is 1995, and the pink bar is 2014. So next, I have engineering, also around 20% going to women, and again, decreasing quite a bit as we go up to the doctorate. And last, I think, is math, math and statistics. So women are much better represented in math and statistics. There's not a lot known about why this is. The hypothesis is maybe a lot of high school math teachers are getting bachelor's degrees in math. But again, we're around 40% at the bachelor's degree, but it goes, we have the numbers, down to around 30% at the PhD. And I think that was all the data I had. Oh, right. So one question the NSF does ask when they collect all this data is um, why are people who are not working in STEM, why did they leave the workforce? And the one thing that we noticed here when we were looking at the data is a lot more women are leaving to care for families than in the men category. And this is true across demographics, so for the white women, the Asian women, and underrepresented women. I think that was it for data. Yeah. So we thought we would start by um, introducing ourselves a little bit and telling you um, our STEM story. So I feel uncomfortable being the only one standing, so I'm going to sit back down. <laughs> so I started out as a physics major. Um, because I loved science as a high school student, and physics was my favorite class, so I thought I would major in physics. Um, 
and we had to take a lot of math classes to get a physics degree, so I just kept taking math classes, and there was a moment when I realized I can get a math minor um, if I just take one more class. And then once you had a math minor, you only need two more classes to get a math major. So I took those two classes. And then my advisor pointed out that I was spending all of my time doing math homework that I didn't really need to be spending all of that time doing. Um, and I wasn't doing any of my physics homework anymore. So he suggested that I go to grad school in math, which is what I did. Um, it was much harder than undergrad, so I left my first PhD program um, somewhat suddenly, moved to Montana, got married, um, and really, really missed it, and then decided I wanted to go back and found out years later that I left thinking that they wouldn't really notice that I left because I wasn't doing very well. Um, but after um, we all came back from break and I didn't come back, my professors were like, what happened to Christy? She was doing really well, why'd she leave? And I just, I would never knew. Um, and I wouldn't have ever known if I hadn't run into one of my friends from that program years later. And now here I am, I'm at St. Kate's, teaching math to a whole bunch of amazing women. So I'm gonna to go to Kay next. So um, I'm actually not a physicist, I'll confess that first. I'm a chemical engineer, um, but I teach physics. So I guess engineers can do a lot of different things. Um, I always say that my STEM story was really kind of boring. I um, was very lucky. I grew up in a family of all girls. I had a grandmother who was really quite accomplished mathematician. Um, I had all female uh, science teachers going right through high school, which I think in the 70s is pretty unusual. Um, never had that experience of somebody telling me I couldn't do math or do anything, and I just kind of went along pretty oblivious to things, um, just taking hard courses because they were fun and interesting. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Um, I started out as a chemistry major and then had never heard of engineering, if you can believe that. Um, met a guy in college who was going to be an engineer and went, that sounds good. <laughs> so, so I switched into engineering and um, found my way up through grad school and I did oh, what Christy said, that it was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, but yeah, now I'm teaching physics at St. Kate's and uh, doing everything I can to try to help the wonderful young women who come into our programs believe that yes, they too can be physicists and engineers. Um, so the beginning of my story, I guess, when I was in um, high school, I never really felt gravitated to any topic, not math, not science, not English. I wasn't quite sure what I liked. And, um, but I do remember we got a computer in, I think, 1994. And I had a younger brother who was about two years younger than me. And right when we got the computer, one of the first things he did is he took apart the entire computer. And my mom was like... <laughs> I bought that with a credit card. <laughs> you know, like, like the concept of buying a computer then was a lot more expensive. And my brother had taken it apart. And he said to my mom, he said, well, if I don't take it apart, I don't know how it works. And so then he, um, he figured out how the computer worked. And to this day, my mom has never had, uh, she's never bought a computer because he keeps building her computers. Um, so like that just struck me as this is um, his world. This is kind of like what boys do and... Um, in 1994, we also had to share a phone. So when he got the computer, we didn't have to share the phone. So I guess I was kind of distracted by that. But it just seemed like a very, it didn't seem like it was something that um, my friends were interested in. But he and his friends, they would do LAN parties. And so it just seemed very different than um, what girls did or at that age. Um, so then in my first job, I worked in a small office and I started doing all the computer stuff because a lot of people were really afraid of putting a CD-ROM in, updating software, doing things like that. And I actually thought it was pretty fun. And so I kept doing this for everybody until pretty soon people were asking me to like stay late and they would pay me cash to show them how to use a computer. And one guy had been retired and he came back and so he asked me, could I show him like how to click or double click? And I'm like, this is like... I love this. This is awesome. And so um, then I started taking analog files and making a database so that we could like have different things. And I just started stepping into it. And I still didn't think I was in technology. And then I went to um, school to be a sign language interpreter. And t at the very end of my um, journey in that, I got to my internship and I was like, I do not want to be a sign language interpreter. So I went back to school for the broadest degree possible, which was 
communications and learning how to write and focusing on writing. And then from there, I went to be a project manager in technology and then a product manager. Um, and I've always worked on very technical products. So I'm usually working on APIs, which are application programming interfaces. And um, if you told me that I would be doing that, like if you told my 14-year-old self that, I would have never believed that in a second. So I kind of went through in a really roundabout way. I didn't really have an interest in math or science until it kind of like hit me right in the face and I was doing it and I didn't really think I was doing it, so. So now you know a little bit about us, but we don't know anything about you. So we were wondering how many people here identify as, I have a list of terms, and you can interpret them broadly. Um, scientists, nerds, techies, geeks, anyone interested in STEM, raise your hand. Woohoo. Um, the other thing we were wondering as um, we looked at the data is how many people in the audience left their um, job or career to take care of a family? Thank you. Um, so I have some questions here, but I want to make sure you know that these are just questions we're guessing that you're interested in. And I'm not very good at guessing what people are interested in. So if you want to ask questions, we would much prefer that. Um, it is a little bright up here, and you are a little dark. So you might have to wave at me so I can see you. Um, awesome. So I can't address representation probably in math, but as an engineer, I will address it. Okay, so I walk around the world looking at how things are designed. And I can't tell you how often I look at something and go, that was designed by a six foot tall man. <laughs> okay? Um, Christy, as a smaller woman, we've had this conversation how, you know, things don't fit women, things are dangerous for women. And now I'm also saying, you know, large, you know, people who are very tall have, I mean, it, it's not strictly women, but I'm just speaking as a woman. Um, I think that ha simply having a more diverse <laughs> workforce, more diversity in design opens the opportunity for more things to be a better fit for more people. Um, so this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart with um, Hack the Gap. So it's an all-women hackathon that I run um, with my co-founder, Jenna Pedersen. And we really focus on this representation in what we do because we build applications and software. <clears throat> and if, you, um, if we don't have representation, then we only have products that are representing a portion of, of, the, um, of the world. And so that can show up in a lot of different ways, but right now when we're in um, th this app acceleration and startups, we're getting a lot of companies that weren't even around you know, five or 10 years ago and they're billion dollar valuation companies. And um, if those companies were started by um, women or there were more women at the top, um, you would probably see in this audience when we asked the question about how many people left their job to raise a family or to, for family obligations, you would probably see a lot more men. You might see even less hands go up because maybe there would be solutions where companies offer things where it's more blended, like daycares on site and things like that. Um, so it matters in the companies that we build, but it also matters in the problems that we solve. I heard this really fantastic story once about how there was a team of people and they were trying to solve a problem and basically, um, the analogy for it was that uh, I think it was a, like a refrigerator or some type of thing. I can't remember the product. And somebody on the team was from America, and so they kept thinking about the problem from the, you know, ketchup is in the refrigerator, and that was what they knew culturally. So then somebody else on the team said, well, that's weird. And I think, I don't remember where they're from, I think Australia. And they said, that's strange. We keep our, um, we keep our ketchup in the cupboard. 
And so when you're thinking about solving a problem, whether you look in the fridge or you look in the cupboard, you're going to have different things that you could pair with if you're out of ketchup. So the idea is like you're out of ketchup, you go in the fridge, you're like, okay, mayonnaise, salad dressing, all these other things. But if you go in the cupboard, you might start to find different solutions that you weren't. So if you have a representation from different cultures, different gender identities, then you start to get different lenses in the conversation about how to solve problems and what to build and what features to eliminate and things like that. From a slightly different perspective, um, as a woman who was the only um, woman in her graduate program with children, um, there is a very powerful thing about seeing people who look like you doing what you want to do and even knowing that it's possible. Um, I have three young daughters and I teach at an all women's school and it took me a very long time to convince my children that men could be mathematicians too. <laughs> So it really is about who you see doing certain things. And if you don't see women being engineers, being mathematicians, um, then you don't know that you're capable of doing it. And you question yourself a lot more. Um, and it takes a lot of emotional energy to quash those doubts that you could be using to solve problems. I would much rather be solving problems than convincing myself I'm capable of solving problems. And if we don't have representation for people to look up to, we're going to lose the next generation and the next generation of people that we don't even know who is coming after us. Um, and Hidden Figures, I think that really demonstrated the point really well. Mm -hmm. Did anybody else have a question? That was, that was better than any of my questions. <laughs> so I'm going to build off that question and ask um, the panel, what changes are we making um, to improve the situation, to increase representation of women in STEM? Um, so this is primarily why my co-founder and I started Hack the Gap, which is the all-women hackathon. Um, we, we wanted to, um, can I glance at the question again one more time? Yeah, so we wanted women to see other women and be on teams with women. So like most women, um, well, just to back up, a hackathon is basically a weekend project where everyone comes together, like everyone in this room would come together and then divide into small teams and build something over the course of the weekend, demonstrate it on Sunday, and then have an award ceremony through um, like which projects made it to the top. And um, we wanted to bring women together that could be on a team together instead of going to work where they're the only woman on the team, they would be, um, they would be among all women on the team. And, uh, this, I was inspired by this because a lot of people, uh, I kept hearing about hackathons and women would go to the hackathons and somebody would come and the news would like represent or there was somebody, a journalist, asking them about their, their um, project and inevitably they would always ask the woman, what is it like to be the only woman on the team? And women got really tired and I saw a lot of this on the internet, they were just complaining about like, why doesn't anyone ever ask me about my ideas or like what I contributed or what the problem was or something substantial other than my feelings about being the only woman on the team. So we wanted to change that. And um, in three years of running it, we have seen so many women go into the workforce, start their own companies, get new jobs, make a new stronger network. Um, like if we go to a networking event and we just meet each other, we don't necessarily have a bond that's formed, we just know each other. But if you go through this idea of this project, you have spent time together and it's an experience that bonds you together. So then when you go back into your real world, you're like, oh, okay, I, she was awesome to you know, work with or Christy was really, really dependable on the team and so then that starts to change the networks that happen within people getting jobs. So I'm just going to speak um, to experiences working with, again, young women in my professional environment and, um, you know, working with them and trying to teach them how to be confident in their ability to do things and to get them over the fear of just trying things. Um, I know, again, working primarily as an engineer and then I do research and um, the research we do involves a lot of building of equipment and testing and, and things just break and things just don't work frequently. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've noticed over the years, because I've also worked um, in other 
in other engineering programs where they were primarily male. That didn't seem to bother guys so much. Um, but getting women kind of over that hump of just trying things. I mean, the number of times I say, oh, what was it I say to my students? Um, it, I always say, it's okay to fail. It's okay to fail, okay? And it's, it's only a failure when you stop trying. I always say, failure is an option in my classes. And, that, and so they get kind of sick of hearing it. Um, but I think it's really important for them to hear that because, uh, again, particularly women, my experience has been that they just, it's just not okay. You always have to be really good at, where you do, at what you're doing before you even start doing it. I'm going to very much agree with Kay. And um, there has recently been some data that came out of, you can tell I'm the mathematician, the Mathematical Association of America um, about what structure of courses women work, um, women learn best in. And a lot of it came down to um, when women feel like they belong. And it's less lecture-based and more um, collaborative, very similar to what Kristen was talking about. So at St. Kate's, we've restructured the way we teach a lot of our math courses, so they're not lecture-based. Um, and I know this is happening at lots of universities across the country, um, but I will tell you that it's not enough. And for me, it's coming to events like this and um, talking to people um, who identify as someone who likes math or is, um, as someone who doesn't, I will tell you, um, if I'm sitting on an airplane and someone asks what I do, and I'm a math professor, um, the next comment is either, oh, I loved math in school, um, but usually it's, oh, I hated math in school, and I'm just not good at math. And um, we need to do better um, at telling people that no one feels good at math. I have, so I tell my students there is no way in one semester for you to struggle or cry more about math than I have in my career. And I think that understanding that, um, that it's okay for it to be hard, um, everyone feels that way, is the biggest thing. Last question. Last question. Does anybody have a question? Yes. I would say change the way you talk to other people about math. So, and Kay, you guys can agree with me, just STEM in general. You're not a STEM person or not a STEM person. Um, you're, everyone should identify as someone who likes STEM. If you, um, if you like to solve problems, then you are doing science when you're trying to solve a problem. And it doesn't matter what it is, and it doesn't matter how hard solving the problem was. Um, it's a skill that we all have to practice. And so it's OK if it was hard the first time, and the 50th time, and even the 150th time that you try to solve the problem. But like Kay said, just don't give up. We have a guess, and um, it's that women are um, attracted or socially trained to be attracted to careers in which they feel like they're making a difference in the world. And that's just much more, um, it fits better with biology. It's easier to see that. Um, but it's not necessarily true that the biosciences are the only ones where you can make a big difference and make the world a much better place. Um, all of us have had experiences ourselves or with colleagues in um, greatly improving the world. And I'm not sure how much time we have left. Okay. So we actually have to uh, end the discussion now, but um, 
all of our experts will be uh, watching the movie, and I'm sure they'll be around and happy to talk more about women in STEM. So please uh, help me in thanking them one last time, and enjoy the movie. <laughs>